Welcome to Studio Conversations with Carol Mickett and Robert Stackhouse. My name is Amanda Poss, Gallery Director of Gallery 221 at HCC Dale Mabry Campus. I'll be the moderator for tonight's event. We're so thrilled to have you all here with us virtually. Before we hear from our artists and get to some q and I'd like to introduce the Dean of Associate in Arts at the HCC Dale Mabry Campus, Dustin Lemke, for a few words of welcome. Dustin? Good evening, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well today. Um, we welcome you to HCC. We welcome you to our gallery. Um, thank you for joining us. We do really appreciate you taking time out of your uh, schedule to be here with us. March the 12th, uh, we had a retirement for Carolyn Kosar um, over on the Ebor campus. So I went to that, not realizing it would be the last time I stepped into a gallery with an art show, you know, live and in person. So thank goodness I got to see uh, the work that uh, Micken and Stackhouse have up over the, uh, at the Ebor campus. And, you know, it's a reminder as I was thinking about tonight's event, it's a reminder We've done amazing things online with art, but it's also, it was just this reminder that uh, the one large piece that's uh, in the gallery at Ebor is, I mean, you're just kind of stunned by it. You know, it's, it's, it, it's there and it lets you know it's there, you know? So, and through looking at the pictures, like it's a very different in-person experience. But we're very appreciative. So glad that you're all here in a digital format. I've just been blown away by everything that Gallery 221 is doing uh, online. Um, it makes us so creative to be, to, to see a different way of looking at art and doing art. So um, I can speak for myself, honestly. Today I've been doing a bunch of administrative mumbo gumbo junk, um, emails, and it, it forces me to go inside my own head and I'm by myself all day anyway, and then you're doing all this, um, you know, administrative mumbo gumbo. I don't know what else to call it. So it's very lovely to be able to come together as a group of people to think about art, to look at art, and to end the day on a really inspirational note and to think about what, what's life and what's meaning and what's beauty. Um, it's certainly a very inspirational way to do that. So thank you to everybody involved and we're glad that everybody's here on behalf of HCC, welcome. Thank you so much, Dustin. Um, before we hear from our artists, just like any other event, I have a few words of thanks. So first off, I want to express my appreciation to the Student Government Association at the HCC Dale Mabry campus. All of our programs, exhibitions, events are funded by them. So we couldn't do what we do without you guys. Thank you so much. I also want to say thank you to the HCC Dale Mabry campus president, Dr. Alan Witt, who is here with us, and also to Dean Lemke, who you just heard from. They're both tireless advocates and supporters for the art, and we're so fortunate to have both of them at the Dale Mabry campus. I'm also very personally grateful for these next two individuals, Emiliano Setacasi and Ashley Williams. They're my Gallery 221 uh, team, and everything that I do, I can't do by myself. So. They worked hard to put together this event, advertise it. They're here now working behind the scenes, doing the screen sharing and commenting. So thank you, Emiliano. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, finally, my thanks to our speakers, Carol Mickett, Robert Stackhouse. We're so excited to um, kind of invite you back to HCC, albeit virtually as a follow-up to your exhibition. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise with us. As we get started, I just want to remind our audience once again that this session will end with some Q&A. We want this to be a conversation, right? That's why we call it a studio conversation. Um, so throughout the event, if you hear something that sparks an idea or some interest, um, please at any time put your question into the chat. We'll address them the order in which they appear. Um, but in particular, if you're a student, if you identify that, we'll make, we'll, we'll especially try to get to yours. So, Carol, Bob, I'm now going to talk directly to you two. Uh, tell us a little bit about your backgrounds and about your work so that the people who are in our audience can learn more about you and your practice. All right. Well, since I'm the oldest, I uh, will start first. And uh, um, I guess I can abbreviate this as, as much as I can to give you the information that, that would be helpful. I um, was a charter member of the University of South Florida and in, in the art program. 
and graduated in 1965, much to the dismay of my mother. It took me five years instead of four. Then, uh, then I, I went to, uh, of course, that's why I, I, I'm so smart now, is that I took that extra year. But um, I went from there to the University of Maryland to graduate school. And from that point, I started teaching at the Corcoran Gallery of Art while I was still a student at, at the uh, University of Maryland. And there's where I met major artists who, who were also teaching there. And, and I learned a thing or two about what it took to be a professional artist. They came, taught their class, went home to their studio. Uh, it was an art school, not a university. So there, there, there wasn't all that other uh, mumbo jumbo stuff going on. <laughs> and and uh, so, so as a matter of fact, a lot of the faculty left 15, 20 minutes early you know, because they wanted to get back to their studio. So that was an endearing thing to learn. Uh, and um, uh, from there, when I was at University of, uh, or at, at uh, the, the Corcoran College of Art, uh, I was uh, included in a couple of national uh, art shows, and, and that was really instrumental to me. The very first museum show I was ever in was at the Detroit Art Institute in Detroit, and uh, uh, with, with, again, world-class famous artists. So it was, I, I was very fortunate in that I was able to learn from observation from people who were, who were uh, somebody, who, who were people I revered. And uh, I, I worked at the Corcoran for, 20 some odd years retiring uh, from there in, two, in, in uh, 1987. That was quite a while ago. I sort of did the math the other day and it's uh, 30 some odd years or something like that. And uh, uh, it, it, I, I left there and, and was living in, in Soho in New York City where uh, I, I showed in, in galleries and museums there and around the country and uh, had retained my ties with the University of South Florida coming back in the, in the uh, late 80s and again in the 90s and doing work at Graphic Studio, uh, having a, uh, a large installation show at, the, at, at CAM. And uh, it, I, I think my relationship to the University of South Florida in this case and, and Tampa Bay area, which also is where my mother was living at the time and, uh, and so it was a good place to come back to when we were uh, 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 looking for a, a place to call home. So um, I am the Carol Mickett, the Mickett of the Mickett Stackhouse. And uh, my journey to this place is very different than Robert's. Um, I have always been involved in the arts, making art part of the art world. But, um, and I went to undergraduate to be, do art, but I also was very strong in academics. And when I went to, after I left NYU, I went to the University of New Hampshire, where I studied with Jung Kaneko, who is one of the famous ceramicists, ceramic artists in the country, in the world. And I studied with him his first year, and he brought in all of these artists, and he brought in Louise Nevelson, who is to this day my favorite. And um, she flew down the aisle, and um, her work is always my favorite because one of the things I'm very interested in is mathematics and structure, and her work is very much like that. Um, but Jun left after my first year, and then I was, in a way, whisked away by um, the people in the classics department, the people in the history department, and the people in the philosophy department. And from that, I went to the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, where I earned a PhD in philosophy and then became a philosophy professor all the while staying in the arts, spending a lot of time in New York City. Um, and then I um, had many jobs and I ran a philosophy program and I chose to leave because it wasn't doing what I needed to do. And I was starting to do theater then, so I left and I did theater and then I was given a radio show called Art Radio where I had conversations with lots of artists, put on plays, poetry readings. And it's where I met Robert because he was a guest 
he, this was in Kansas City, and he was part of a foundation, and he was my guest on my radio show. And before I interviewed anybody, I spent lots of time with the person, finding out who they were. And then I was hired to make a movie about him. Um, an award-winning movie. Oh, yes, an award-winning <laughs> movie. And it was from that um, that we learned to collaborate together. And from that, that was in the late 90s, and we've been working together ever since. In the meantime, you know, I've published poems, I've written speeches for people, and, and I'm very involved in social issues. I've been on lots of boards. I'm currently on the board of the Pinellas County Urban League. And I'm working now that we live in Tarpon Springs. I very much support um, Peace for Tarpon. So one of the things that we have found is, and Robert has this in his history as well, how important it is when you're making art to have a lot of content. And I think that that's one of the reasons why we work so well together is there's technical prowess, especially Robert, I have to say, but there's lots of conceptual content that we bring to what we make, that we think about what we're doing. And unless there's conceptual background and a lot of all sorts of knowledge, um, that's what feeds our work. You guys have such interesting and diverse backgrounds. And so I think that's particularly important. I'm so glad you guys noted all of that for the students that we have in the audience that are probably trying to figure out their own pathways through education right now, uh -huh. too. And you guys were in a lot of different things and you never know what opportunities are going to, to spur something really momentous, like sure. your meeting for that interview, right? Um, and, and I, I should note, you guys also were recently awarded from Creative Pinellas, right? You're our artist laureates. Yes. We have so, our crown. <laughs> we're supposed to have laurel leaves. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about your recent exhibition at HCC. So shortly before HCC closed its campuses in response to coronavirus, you had an exhibition at Gallery 114 at Forest City campus. It was titled As the Golf Turn Turns. It was open from February through March. Can you tell us a little bit about that exhibition and, and talk a little bit more about some of the recent works that you made that were included in the show? Well, I think that if you look behind us, you can <laughs> see some of that work and that large painting that the Dean was talking about although it looks a little purple in this. It's really blue. It looks blue in that one. Doesn't? Um, well, I'll just say, I mean, as the Gulf turns, we've been working a lot always about issues about water. And um, so we became very, very interested in the issues of climate change and um, how CO2 is becoming so prevalent in the water and CO2 is what traps heat. And when there's too much CO2, the waters heat up. And as a result, we all know from science class that when things heat up, they expand. So the water expands. One of the reasons why we have get flooding, also it melts things. So it melts the ice at the poles. And when you have more water, you get flooding. So, um, having the CO2 in the water is not a very good thing. And we've seen during the corona COVID-19 that stopping even in this small time has really helped. Um, although it would take a number of years at this way to really make any real change. But um, our work in that show was particularly about that um, and about um, honoring, you can see behind Robert's left ear, um, <laughs> a, a honorific painting for the mangrove, which is one of the things, in addition to plankton, that are the greatest absorbers of CO2. So um, we have a lot of mangroves in Florida, 
and they are to be saved and honored and nurtured because the more we can have them, the more it's going to help us. Does that mean we're going to do some plankton paintings now? Yeah, maybe we'll <laughs> get some plankton. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, you, you mentioned it's honorific, but I've also heard you refer to them as icons, which yes. gives us this kind of almost religious mm -hmm. it's right? Yes. We, we worship them. <laughs> <laughs> and the alive. live oak, which was the other one, the live oaks, big trees like that. They, sh they did research in the west part of the country in Seattle and I mean in Oregon, not Washington, and Washington uh, about the trees out there. And they found that it wasn't the number of trees, it was that you wanted big trees. And the live oak you can see is spreads out and it absorbs CO2, which is also a Florida tree. I think something about why, why it's such an icon, why we made it an icon, it's, it's, it, it's only about that tree. You know, it's, it, there's no other uh, uh, design element in it that says, that, that tells the story. It is an oak and it is a uh, mangrove tree. And all that you can find out about oaks and mangrove trees, that's what those two paintings are about. So it's a very minimal involvement with, uh, with an image in order to contain the most information that it can. And it has a sense of being an icon and being honored because it's painted in sort of the, it's gold paint um, that changes as you look at it. And gold is always something that's very valuable. So we made that particular choice about materials to add to the content. Yeah, the, the environmental component to your work comes across so strongly with that show in particular and the works mm -hmm. behind you, so very appropriately for this moment. Um, so I wanna expand on that a little bit. You both previously noted a sculpture created in 2004 in Indianapolis called Confluence that you credit as generating an even deeper relationship with nature in your work. Um, would you describe that project for our audience and explain how the conversations around that project led to more recent works like In the Blue, which I'll do this moment for the students. Um, all of our HCC students have this textbook, right? And just so you know, uh, that work in the blue appears in that textbook, right? Yay. You can see it there. So the up on top of this is no slouch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So, you know, Confluence led to in the blue, which then led to some of those works that you were just describing. So can you expand that environmental focus in your work and how it all started? Well, we had a Chicago dealer that called us up one day and says uh, that the uh, uh, Michael Graves Arts Park in, uh, in Indianapolis wants, us to, wants to commission us to do a, a large sculpture, outdoor sculpture for their new Michael Graves Arts Park. Uh, and uh, he said, what do you want to do? And, and we said, Indianapolis. And he said, yes. And we said, oh, we want to work with Indiana Limestone. And there was a pause on the other side. I mean, he, he was our dealer. He knew us. And he said, uh, you've never worked in stone before. <laughs> And we said, no, yeah. <laughs> like a challenge. And, yeah, so we, we said, but what else would we work with in Indiana, <laughs> Indiana limestone? So, so we uh, set it up and we went out to Indiana. How and, big is it? Oh, it, it, it's 160 tons. <laughs> um, uh, two, two about uh, 200 foot pieces and separated by about 500 yards. Do you have and a they, picture? They were, they, they were at one point together that that's down by the river the white river and and uh up there you can see a tower through the trees and the other sculpture is right next to it and you can see the tower through the trees there so it's and and the 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 deck if you go from the point of the deck straight it would go right in and come out of the the tall stone right in the center so, of it. Well, the, the deck was designed to go inside the stone. So it's right. meant to be a wooden deck and that and we wanted it all down by the river because the river floods in the spring and we knew, they told us that the, uh, it would flood over our sculpture. We loved that idea. It would but, poke out. But anyway, getting back to, to, to the thing is that, that everybody was concerned with us because 
because we showed up and we said, all right, you know, is there a stone cutter here? <laughs> and they said yes, and they had stone, stone carving in their school. So uh, the guy that was there showed us a few things with a chisel and uh, how to use a pneumatic thing, stuff like that. And, and we're going and looking at stones and we're, we're looking at, at uh, stone quarries. And we're looking at 20, 25 ton stones to, to have uh, brought into our site. And uh, uh, the, the biggest stone there was over 20 tons when we finished it. And it took a special crane to pick it up and put it into its place and stuff. And so we're, we're um, going along. I got there. to drive the crane. Yeah, we're going along designing things, you know, and some of the people come up to us and they say, we're concerned, you know, like, what's it going to look like when we're finished? And I said, well, we don't know. <laughs> and and uh, then they, uh, they, they were really concerned because they say, normally when somebody learns a new medium, they do something small. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, well, this is a commitment, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll figure this out and we'll make it work, you know. And uh, so, so we, we did. And, and, uh, uh, the, the stone guy, the, the, the master stone cutter that was there said, they haven't told you yet. And we said, what have they not told us? He said, I'm not going to be here. So all of a sudden, our, our go-to guy wasn't going to be there. And we did hire a, uh, a stone cutter from Senegal. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, he, he mostly carved gravestones in, in back in, in Senegal. And, uh, but he's the one who told us, take your time. The stone will listen to you and listen to the stone. And of course, when you're working on a 20 foot, uh, 20 ton stone, that's 13 foot tall on its side, when it's supposed to be vertical, you, you know, you're, you're having to listen to it. But anyway, we got through all that. We were working. Well, one on thing is, is that we, they did an article in the paper, and we had, oh, what, 60, 40, 45 people all these volunteers paper. came, to, and they helped carve the stone. And, and we weren't going to put all of this poetry all over, but we realized that when people were carving it, and we had all these lines, and people were doing hand tools and pneumatic, but that the language from people, different people's hands, was mm -hmm. like a language. And um, there was this one woman who like, could barely lift anything and she'd go blah, blah. And it was the, and she made about this much and it took her like three days, but it was the most beautiful. I mean, we would go and look at it all the time. It looked like an eggshell. Yeah, it was I mean, just the, gorgeous. And, and the way we would shape the stones, I mean, they came very irregular and we shaped them into those, uh, uh, vertical forms that were sort of curved on the end. So they, they created a, a line. If you stood on the side, you saw the line diminishing and in a curvilinear way. Uh, and the way you do it is you, you just cut with a, a power saw horizontal lines. You can see them in this photograph where the horizontal lines were. Then what you do is you take the hand chisel and you go against that and you just chip off chunks that are two, three inches long. And it takes quite a while, but the, the thing you had to learn and we had to teach volunteers was to uh, let the, the hammer and mallet do, you know, the mallet mm -hmm. and chisel do the work. And we had a lot of women and a lot of, a lot of men doing it. And, and um, it was interesting who was able to do this. And, and we wasn't. lived there, what, six months yeah. doing this. So um, we became part of, of the community. Yeah, so, so we were down at the river carving that piece that, that was made out of, uh, what was it, 12 flat stones that had to be put together. And Carol made um, paper patterns, like dressmaking mm. patterns, because we had, these were too heavy. These stones weighed a couple tons each. You couldn't just pick them up and move them around and say, oh, I want it this way or that way. We had to take and do a drawing of each stone, a tracing of it on paper, and then move those around. And then we had to decide where to cut and do that. And if you look at that photograph of the, of the piece uh, down by the river, the, the very flat one, uh, if you could bring that up again, um, you can see um, that it, it uh, is very, very solidly made. You can see the horizontal cuts, but it doesn't look like it's a number of stones. So one thing, um, back to what you were alluding to earlier, Amanda, 
I mean, when I was young, um, when I was in, well, I still am young, but when I was in junior high school, I had to take home ec. And one of the things I had to do in there was make a dress, which, you know, I didn't know how to do that. My mother didn't sew, but my next door neighbor did. And I won the prize as the best dress. And from then I kept making clothes and designing clothes. And it was doing that, that, that knowledge that allowed me to put those stones together um, mm. on this project. So all of those things you learn along the way all come to you and are great resources. So the more opportunities one has to learn all these things is always an asset. And who would think making dresses would transfer into, you know, stones? Talk okay. about well, like the, fabric. The you know, it's this it. very tangible thing we all share a history with, right? Craft and processes. And so I like how you brought that to bear on the project, something that's very community driven, connected to nature. Um, there's a comment you guys told me about before, uh, a discussion that emerged out of oh, yeah. A line you can't step into the same room. Yeah, that's yeah. Point. Well, we have, yeah, that's the point <laughs> I was trying to get to, and Carol is hitting me on the side of my leg here. And saying, Why am I being hit for? But we were working on that piece down by the river, and uh, we had we had hired a, a, a student who just graduated as an architect, and he started out as a volunteer, but he got he was so good at it that we finally hired him to uh, to to help us with this. As Carol said, we were there for six months. It was, and uh, it. It was just nothing but dust and shards of, of stone. I mean, it, you see, you see uh, movies of people carving stone. They don't show you the dust because you couldn't see anything. But you know, <laughs> so the dust was all over the place. And uh, so, so they were talking. They were they were just discussing some uh, pre-Socratic philosophers, and uh, they mentioned uh, how you couldn't step into the same room. Heraclitus. 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 And, Heraclitus. and and I. I only caught part of this conversation, but I heard you can't step into the same river twice. And I sort of looked up and I, I said, hey, what a great concept. An artist could spend a lifetime trying to work on that. And uh, so we laughed about that a little bit and then went on and forgot about it, basically. And, and then when we were doing In the Blue, the, the piece that's in the part of the, part of the piece, it's in the, the book, we, we looked at each other when we were installing that thing and we said, wait a minute, we're stepping into that river. Right. And, and <laughs> there's different ways of stepping into the river. There were four different uh, configurations of, of how you go through this blue structure. So uh, that, that was really something. That was the beginning of our understanding that you can just take something like that and not even think about it, but it's, it's so, mm -hmm. so becomes so it permeates so much into your, your creative And process. the thing about In the Blue is it's four different rooms and it's circular. And each room had a whole different feel to it. And, and so you'd walk through it and then you'd go through again. And it was like, you couldn't step in the same river twice because each time you went through, mm -hmm. you were one, a different person. It's a different time. Um, but you had a whole different experience. And in a way, you know, from that, uh, we continued to make places. And one of the things about In the Blue that became really clear is people really like to be in it. <laughs> and when we were taking it down, we had a person that wouldn't leave. I mean, he crawled in it and he said, no, you can't take this down. I'm going to be here. Yeah. And but like in a sense of ownership almost. Yeah. yeah. People yeah. really like being in there and they chose different rooms because each room had a different temperament. And it was fascinating to see who, who chose which room and, and why. And we would talk to them and people had all of these wild theories about what was going on. Um, and from there, I think that we started to think about making places in a way to create 
spaces for people to feel safe in, to have a place outside of the stress of their life. Um, and you can see in, in those, those big um, installations, sculptures that we've done that we've continued to do that. Now, it was, the, the Dean mentioned the, the large painting in the show at the, the Ybor campus. And that, that is also related to place. Because mm -hmm. uh, um, I, I remember walking uh, the artist Jules Olitsky through the Corcoran Gallery of Art one day. And uh, he said, uh, there's a special place to stand in front of these paintings. And if you get too close, you miss it. If you're too far back, you miss it. So he says there's a place to be when you're in front of a painting. And that's a what- A color it, field painting? Yeah, it's a color field painting. And so uh, what, it, what it did is his painting lifted off the canvas and sort of made a hologram in, in between you and the canvas. And if you weren't there, you wouldn't notice it. And it was, I, I frankly, as an artist and teaching art, I didn't know that until he told me. Uh, so, but that was, that, that was, uh, uh, my first understanding that a painting is a place. You're directing uh, uh, the universe. You're taking a segment of the universe. And it, it's like when I was taught to stand in front of a Jackson Pollock grip painting and watch it go off your peripheral vision. Uh, and that's what its horizontality was all about, was going beyond your peripheral vision, which you see in this large painting, is that the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the lines of the currents of the world go off the canvas. They go beyond our peripheral vision. Um, the Gulf of Mexico is inside a border. And if you know that, so that's local and there's global. So uh, that was all, you know, how painting and sculpture can sort of superimpose on, on top of themselves. Sculpture is a, uh, is a place, obviously, because it's three-dimensional and it's an object. And if you walk into it, it, it it's architectural. But also is, is a painting, and that's one of the reasons for the scale of that painting, is it creates a place to be. If, can we go and look at the Richmond um, sculpture? That one. That one, Clear Passage. So um, this is, Clear Passage um, is in a lobby in downtown Richmond, and it's with that mosaic, River Song, and then it has these flow lines. And so this is all in one lobby. And it combines in a way the, this two dimensional work we do with the three dimensional work. And then the flow lines which connect, if you extend them, the James River and the other way, the Capitol building in Richmond. But this was indeed a place um, created, it's the main tenant in this, um, building a giant international law firm. So it was to really to create a safe place for people so that they could get out of the hubbub, but you could also be safe because you weren't, you could see, but you could also see this giant mosaic of the James River. And one of the things it did, and this was part of what we had hoped, and we got a lot of feedback, is people would come, you know, to work every day, and they just felt happy and proud because they had this environment. I mean, how many people have an environment like this? And, um, I mean, we were fortunate to, uh, to be able to make this. Well, you, you look at this piece here, and, and it's, it's 43 feet long and uh, 16 feet high and 14 foot wide. Those are two 14 foot benches in the middle. Uh, and uh, you can sort of see them from, from this view. And uh, then it's covered with 72 panels of clear industrial glass. There's no tint in it. So that's why it's sort of invisible. It's all made to be reflective and uh, it's reflective in many ways. Mm -hmm. Even across the street, it's reflected. So we thought about charging the, the building across the street for having our sculpture over there too. But the thing about this is it's, it's a place that needs to be comfortable, that needs to be about safety, but it's, it's two, three tons of glass sitting up there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and 72 panels of it. And it's kind of frightening when you think of that. So it is, 
a lot of detail went into the engineering. This sculpture itself is embedded into the superstructure of the building. Right. Uh, it was, it was uh, components of the sculpture were put in place before the concrete was poured in this part of the building. For the foundation so, so it, it, of the building. Because of the traffic going around and stuff, and because of the glass on it, the engineering was, was something that took about six months to work out mm -hmm. to make sure that it, it all had the right uh, components with it. And, and it was the, the same, same engineering firm that did the whole building. So, so they were the master engineers that, that covered this. And one thing about this, just like with Confluence, we were there when this was both the mosaic was being put in. We went to Germany a lot when the mosaic was being constructed um, with Franz Meyer in Munich. Um, but we were there for months and months. And so the building was being built at the same time we were installing the art, which I would never recommend. Um, <laughs> But we got to know the workers, and the workers would come and talk to us. The workers would bring us all the things and take care of us. And, and as a result, the people who maintain the building and the guards, the guards are like our docents. If people come in, the guards take people around, and they know all the stories about it. And they can stakeholders in the work. Right, and, and it also this whole idea of you can't step in the river twice. So the law firm in their diversity catalog have this whole thing about our mosaic and, and the sculpture. And the first thing they say is you can't step in the same river twice. Absolutely. So all of the art, it's a really incredible way to show how art you know, can be used and can permeate ways in which people think about relationships and how to how to get along even in just describing that project the the feats of engineering those are pretty significant hurdles and challenges that you guys had to address so i'd like to take that and transition it to a more general topic um what are some of the biggest challenges you've had to overcome in your careers and, and how did you work through them well, we both questioned each other about that, and we both have almost the same challenge. <laughs> so. well, well, at least one of the big challenges is having left academia and a sense of identity um, and to take a leap in that river um, and um, sort of say, okay, um, I'm going to take this different path because this different path I think will will suit me better, which I think it has. Um, and that's, that's a major challenge um, when you have an identity and that people think of you in a certain way and then you say, oh, okay, I'm doing this other thing. So that was a major challenge. Um, in 1984, I was commissioned by the Australian National Gallery to do a large installation in their outdoor sculpture park. And uh, uh, at the same time, I was teaching still at the Corcoran College of Art, and I was living in Soho in New York. So there was, there was a lot of uh, uh, disruption. Commuting. There was a, yeah, a lot of commuting, <laughs> a lot of disruption. I mean, I was in Washington, D.C. three days out of the week, the rest of the time in my studio. I went to Australia twice and to Taiwan, where I actually built the sculpture, uh, for, for two weeks uh, and then went back again for the, for the, uh, to watch it after it had been bronze cast. And it was a large 16-ton uh, bronze or 11-ton bronze. And I was able to do all that without missing a day teaching. And I, I at that time, was, was really uh, showing a lot around the country and places. And I had six private galleries in there, or private you know, six galleries around the country, they were all wanting me to do a show every two years and they wanted new work. And they never gave me back the old work if they didn't sell it. They said they were gonna sell it, you know. So that, that meant to continue to make, make work. So it, it came time for me to decide, what am I doing taking the train, going down to Washington DC to teach and then go back and then not have enough time to do my art for all these other shows and stuff. So I finally decided to leave teaching, 
where I was by that time the, the head of the BFA program, had a lot of uh, had a lot of privilege and freedom there and re was very proud of the program that I helped to, to create for, for the Corcoran College of Art. And uh, uh, that was very difficult. I remember the first day that I did not go down to Washington, I said, what's going to happen to me? I'm going to go broke. I won't eat. I'll do all this. Because yeah, all of a sudden, exactly right. I had it's a picture that was, was, was yeah. kind of minuscule. Yeah. I mean, if I hadn't have been selling art, I don't know how I would have made it anyway. But but it was a point where all of a sudden now my whole life depends on my being able to live as an artist. And that was terrifying. And I think that that is, um, you know, you have these big, big things, upheavals in your life. But I think that the challenge, and this is especially something for everybody, but students to think about, is you have the challenge when you're an artist to keep going. Um, and to be in the studio and to think about and make art and nobody, you don't have a job. I mean, you can have shows and deadlines in this, but it's not like you're getting up and going to an office where people are making sure you get there. So there's these big challenges um, to keep doing what you're doing. Um, and to keep having ideas. And sometimes I'll tell you, it's really boring. And sometimes <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, let me do that. And then of course, other times it's just exciting, but um, it's work. And I, I think that, you know, this is a romantic artist thing, but- um, Only if you live in Paris in a garret. <laughs> <laughs> We're a beret every day. <laughs> With a beret. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. What I'm hearing come through all that is this notion of perseverance in, in the face of things. Absolutely. It's a, it, scary it's a and unknown. Yeah, it's a um, marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You just have to, to, do, to do the work. Um, and this notion of, of, of upheaval and change actually brings us really nicely to our next point. Um, spend a few minutes talking about that before we go to Q&A. Uh, for our audience, when, when we were talking about what we should discuss tonight, at the time, the, the big thing was the pandemic, right? How to stay productive? How do you, how do you keep moving forward in, in the midst of this psychological, physical, emotional kind of exhaustion? Um, but over the past week, it's like the world um, overturned one more time and social justice has been particularly at the forefront of the national conversation. Um, and so, you know, artists have long shed light on difficult issues facing our society. And we know that art can be a very powerful catalyst and agent for some of your work. I'm struck by how it, there's this real cry for urgency um, that we need to act, right? That this is, again, this catalyst. Um, and so, you know, work responds to its time. You know, it overlaps with social issues. It overlaps with civil rights. So can you guys both expand on that in your experience? Well, I think that, as you said, artists are always conduits for what's going on at the time. And I think that we're conduits in different ways, some more right there, literal. And we've been seeing with the murder of Mr. Floyd, we've seen a lot of artists quickly um, do murals and um, relate it directly to um, the murder and the protests. And that's been so powerful. Um, I think that our work with climate change has some parallels, although not in terms of direct issues about racism, but it has a direct connection between systematic denial. And that you see um, in, with issues of racism, the systematic denial that this stuff is going on. And that's primarily by white people. I mean, black people know what's going on all the time because they're living it. And I think that with climate change, you have a systematic denial. You see all of this stuff happening, but you want to maintain the status quo because that's just what you do. And it's easier to do that. And for a big bunch of people, they make a lot of money that way. Um, and so um, doing these sort of parallel um, issues is an important thing. 
And I expect and hope, and I know that it's gonna happen, is some incredible art is going to come out of a horrible situation. And um, one can, and a lot of transformation, and especially now that we've been in seclusion, and a lot of things are, are sort of taken away, cobwebs are moved away from our eyes. Because we've been so involved before that, we do, 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 and we don't have time to look. And now we've had time to look, and things are very different. And I'm very hopeful that we'll have substantive transformation in, in things across the board, but primarily with issues of racism and um, law enforcement. Well, I think the, in, in troubled times, the importance of, uh, of, of the arts, you know, the big capital arts uh, mm. is, is uh, it's really, it's really a, a time to be, you know, a young artist really. Oh, yeah. Uh, because cause you, can, you, can, you can do a lot of formation uh, with the outside world as, as with your own inner involvements in it. And you look at art history and you can see this kind of uh, mm -hmm. uh, working this way. I mean, the, the issues are, are provocative and, and it makes for provocative art. And uh, uh, so, uh, you know, it's, I, I remember I was with a class when the World Trade Center came down and I, I, I said, you know, it's been relatively peaceful up till now, except for anybody who's over in Afghanistan or wherever. But for us, I mean, what we've experienced in, in our place uh, in, in home here on the home front, um, it's, it's, it, it's something that has been building and building and building. And, and I, think, I think young, young wow. creative people are going to be very important going on. I, I think it's their future. I think, you know, for both Robert and I, um, you know, being in growing up in the 60s and the 70s during um, civil rights, during the Vietnam War, the women's movement. I mean, that cut our teeth on, on politics and social justice. I mean, when I was a junior in high school, I was handing out on the corner in New Brunswick, New Jersey, pamphlets against the war. Um, and I think, how did my parents let me do that? But, you know, as Robert says, they thought she'd grow out of it. Well, <laughs> little did they know. Um, but, um, you know, these are, I mean, lots of protests, lots of demonstrations, lots of this. And now these young people and the protests, there's a lot of young people and diversity of young people. I mean, this is going to shape their lives. You know, this will be inform them for the rest of their lives. And I say we're really lucky that, you know, there's a change happening. Yeah. Change are coming. Yeah. So I want to now kind of shift gears and open it up to questions from our audience. If you haven't asked your question yet, go ahead and, and start typing that in. But I mean, we've had a few. So um, Ashley, will you tell us our first, first question from the audience? Perfect. Well, thank you all for your comments and questions tonight. So our first question comes from Anna, and she would like to know the name of that award-winning movie that you made. <laughs> okay, so it was called Robert Stackhouse and Artist at Work. And um, the way it happened was Robert was commissioned to make a sculpture at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City. And um, he was part of a foundation, well he still is, the Belcher Family Foundation in Kansas City. And they commissioned me to do a video about it because um, the person in Michigan wanted to show this. Yeah, that was in a show in Michigan at the same time and they wanted some interactive kind of involvement. This was So then um, what happened was the Nelson Atkins Museum had been um, expanding and they had all of these bids out to architects and they had had um, criteria of how it was supposed to be expanded. And of course they chose the person who didn't follow the criteria and expanded the, um, 
the, the museum, which it has been done, um, right through part of the sculpture park, which was to take away where Robert's site for the, for the, um, now, I was commissioned to do this uh, as a commemoration for, I think it was the 25th anniversary of the Hall Foundation, you know, Hallmark, this is Kansas City, the Hall Foundation Sculpture Garden. I mean, I was right next to an Alexander Calder, and there was a Louisa Abakanovitz right there, and there was a, 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 a you know, Judy, um, Judy, Judy Pfaff, and, and, and really a lot of different artists were, were doing stuff around there. And uh, um, he... It, it was a it was the uh, commemoration for the 25th anniversary of the sculpture park and the architect decided to build his building right in the middle of that uh, sculpture park so they had to move everything and mine was a site specific piece so um the movie got way better because now there was drama <laughs> that was going on <laughs> <That's> <laughs> interesting. so um and there became controversy because i was well, what, what, what upset me was that they knew for about a month that I wasn't going to be able to complete it, but they didn't tell me. So yeah. I kept working. So the, the movie shows the sculpture being taken apart, and it was made with um, Kansas post rock. Um, unbeknownst to a lot of people, there weren't trees in Kansas, even though they're in the movies. So when they made fence posts, they couldn't use trees. They, had a, they dug this limestone out of the what used to be an ocean um prehistoric ocean and they made their posts out of what's called post rock because it's limestone and um so you see these big stones flying through the air and it's very sad but as a result of that lots of paintings of this sculpture were made and then the the film it was like as Robert says, it's a, it's a 10, 12 minute film that captures his whole life. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it won an award at a film festival. Fantastic. Uh, we have another question. Yes, so our second question is, how can we ensure that art is available to disadvantaged communities? The ability to express emotion is so important now more than ever. Well, one can answer that in two ways. How is it available, meaning to see or to own or to make? And um, I think that to make, um, one can make art out of just about anything. Um, and to see, I mean, now, if you have a computer, you can see all sorts of art because people have put it on um, the, the internet and have all these free Zoom meetings. I mean, now art's more available than it ever was. Yeah, perhaps in, in some ways. Um, I wonder too what you guys think about to kind of follow up with that question to see like in your community, like, like that physical object, which is so important for so many reasons, right? So how do we make sure that it's still going, you know, those physical objects aren't just in some, like in front of a, a high rise downtown. Right. Well, there, there's there's more community involvement in that, and you know, and it's it's uh, more personalized, more localized, uh, and it, it becomes more um, more informative to the people there. I think I think we had people in in Richmond, Virginia, or any of the other places, and they they saw an uh, an identity with with themselves through through what they saw there. So I think I think when art does that, it's really good. It's when it's just the, that that almost corporate logo that's sort of abstracted, that's put in front of a building that's sort of a put off. But remember at one time that wasn't, one time that was very uh, uh, avant-garde stuff. Uh, I have a question for you guys too, because we, we have a lot of students in the audience, a lot of artists. Um, what advice do you have for these students, makers learned in, in your careers? Oh, advice? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, um. well, since, since I, I ran a BFA program in, in Washington, D.C., it was an undergraduate program, but it was people who had dropped out of graduate schools all over the place. And uh, they, they were uh, interested in, in uh, really finding out who they were. I mean, they, they really learned how, 
who they were, where they are, and where they're going, or where they think they're going to be going. And those were that. That's pretty much what we taught at the Corcoran. Not how to do a painting, not how to make a sculpture, but but those kind of things. Who are you in in this thing? And um, not a lot of them became artists or famous artists. A number of them did, um, but. Uh, it was their own choice. I mean, they, they received tools and information about things to do. They went on to other very interesting things that they wanted to do as much as being an artist. I think Carol alluded to it before. One of the great challenges of being an artist is doing it for the rest of your life. Think of that. Get up every morning and go to wherever your studio is and make art when you're having a terrible day. Mm. It's hard to do. It's hard for us. I mean, we have other things. It gets in our way. Things get in our way. Oh, I'm not going to go to the studio. I mean, I can't do that today because I got to, I got to do yard work or something like that. You know, it 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 gets in your way. And and in order to keep doing this, it is very very difficult. And you've got to really love what you're doing. And so many people find out they love something a little bit different than just making a painting. And one of the things I think that's really important. If you're a student and you're studying art, you should do it with gusto. And you should be involved, go to all the openings you can go to, talk to people, um, go to the museums. And maybe as Robert says, you end up not being an artist and you get do something else. But everything you do now is going to contribute. And I'll tell you, my philosophical training, and I've had a lot of it, I mean, I'm, I can do, and I have done all of these different things because of the training I had. It's like, I know how to approach a problem or approach a project and figure out how to do it because I've been trained to really think analytically about things and to just jump in and, okay, let me do this. So my training allows me to move. Your training as an artist, which is teaching you how to take something that a blank piece of paper, that's the scariest thing, or a blank canvas, or a hunk of clay, or a board, and, and make it into something interesting and beautiful or ugly and, and meaningful. Um, that is something uh, most people can't do. I, I think another piece of advice that's very important is to be creatively involved uh, and creatively learned. And uh, I, at, at the Corcoran, we, we realized, and I mean, I went through a university system and I learned art history from day one, Paleolithic, you know, stuff all the way up to probably the beginning of 20th century, nothing anywhere near where I wanted to study. And we never ever got to that in art history. And so in, in, in studio, when you're a studio artist, you really need to go backwards. Go with who's influencing right now? Who's your favorite artist today? What kind of art do you really like? And then who influenced that person? And then this is work, you know, you have to do some work and doing this, <laughs> but who did this? Who did that? I mean, uh, you know, uh, Picasso was influenced by Goya, and Goya was influenced, you know, it, it, that kind of thing. You see the same paintings throughout history, uh -huh. the same paintings throughout history. Uh, and there's not a lot, you know, like they say in, in, in writing that there's only 11 plots, you know, well, there's not that many more pictures. <laughs> so you need to know, I think you need to know art history and what the context of the art world is. That'll really be very helpful instead of being out there on an island. I mean, a lot of creative people think that's what I want to be is I want to be out on the island. And the problem with that is, and this is my art school teaching thing, is that's naive art. Uh, the primitive art or not, I'm sorry, not primitive art, but, but home, you know, self-schooled art. And it, it's without the knowledge of your peers. That's such good advice. Thank you guys so much. That idea of transformation, critical thinking, um, entering into a dialogue, knowing your history, also important, no matter what field you're in, um, wow. student or as a professional, right? Uh -huh. um, so it is now seven o'clock. I want to say thank you guys so much for sharing your, your wisdom with us, so generously of your experiences. 
Um, and, and thank you to our audience for joining us uh, for our studio conversations. So we're going to have a follow-up event. This is shameless promotion here. We'll have a follow-up event on June 12th with Kiko Katani. So we invite you all to come back uh, and join our next virtual event. And again, we're going to try to make this available online on our YouTube channel if you want to go back and um, reflect more on some of what you heard. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. We're going to can come to our studio by appointment. So you can contact Amanda and she knows how to get in touch with us. Uh, or you can go to info at nickedstackhouse.com. But um, because of COVID-19, we don't just let people come in. But if it's, um, you know, people want to come in and wear a mask and be <laughs> safe, um, we can welcome you. So you guys, you got your open invitation from these artists. Go check out a wonderful studio. I can't wait to dive in there. Look through your archives. We'll make the art history. Uh, oh. Be super happy. So, again, thank you for your generosity coming up with that invitation. Uh, we're going to end by replaying the slideshow that we started with at the beginning, so you can go back through and see some of the works uh, made by Make It Stack House Studio. And some quotes about it. So, thank you all so much. Take care and be well. Thank you.